Coming up, wide open throttle. Behold the light. And how much power does the new engine make? Part 9 of Project Frankfurt. I'm gonna go get the precious third in. Why is the color so big on this thing? I feel like Dracula. But when I think about it, it's to protect you from the oil leaks. That must be it. The ultimate leaking machine. Nice. What's in the box? Tell me, come on, I need to know. Hold on to your rod bearings. And I'm getting to it. <laughs> yes. Give me my shocks. Say hello to Bilstein B6 Demtronic shocks by Evolve Automotive. Same shocks that I have on Project Rally, B6 Demtronic, which I absolutely adore. They completely transformed the ride. These, however, have been developed and made specifically to Evolve Automotive specification by Bilstein and they are made to be even more compliant meaning they are more comfortable in the comfort setting and they are a bit stiffer in the Sport Plus setting so they're even better for the track. On top of that they addressed one key issue that every single one of these cars has with stock suspension whether it's Bilstein, Zax or whatever and that is the rake that they have from the factory where the front end sits slightly higher than the rear. Project Rally has that and it's really really annoying with these shocks, Evolve addressed that issue and the car should sit level front to back. So I'm really excited to try them, see how it looks and feel how it drives. First, remove the sway bar. Unhook the wheel speed sensor and the brake pad wear sensor and the brake line as well. Now remove the pinch bolt. So much salt here, it's ridiculous. So now I need to lower the entire assembly and get the strut out. This EDC connector I already disconnected in a attempt to stop the computer from switching the EDC shocks into the stiffest setting because the front walls in the shocks failed and then it automatically kicks them into the stiffest setting and it is unbearable to drive, so, so uncomfortable. Don't forget to remove the little sway bar for the headlight level sensor. Great, now I have salt in my ear. Need to remove the tie rod. Okay. With the tie rod removed, one can extract the strut. So do that before you do anything else. And now uh, this can rest on the chair. Like that. Has its spring compressor. Compress the spring. When it's loose like that, the spring is compressed and now we can remove the top nut. Uh -uh. More leverage. There you go, that was the ticket. Top mount, spring pad, that doesn't sound brilliant. Here's the brand new one. Then the cup, and ruined bump stop, which we don't need with Bilstein shocks because they have an internal bump stop. So this bloody strut made the car unbearable to drive. So when testing shocks like this, the fluid filled ones, they won't bounce back and that's normal. But this is gas filled. You can see here gas pressure. So when you compress it like this, this shaft should bounce back. And when it doesn't, you know that the strut is kaput. I don't wanna scratch the new strut, so I have a nice blanket here. This is the left one. We have a brand new spring pad here. 
which clips into place. So the end of the spring needs to sit here. So we have this cup here, then the strut mount, then the cup, and a brand new nut. Give it a nice good and twist. Perfect. So make sure that the spring is sitting correctly in the end of the spring pad. Super easy. And that's one strut finito. So line up this notch with the cutout in the spindle. First get the cable through. Okay, I have brand new nuts here. Okay. Ah, very gingerly, that's in. Look at the brave chair. There is a pin in the strut mount that you need to line up. So now I'm gonna lower the car, get to Hugh Jackman to push on the entire assembly here and then we can torque the pinch bolt. Okay, Hugh Jackman is ready to dance. Okay, that'll do. We can relieve Mr. Jackman of his duties. Now we can put back the tie rod. And now the wiring, I'm gonna sneak it past the fender liner and then through the box for the wheel speed sensor and the brake pad wear sensor and then zip tie it along the wheel speed sensor wire and it's gonna look nice and clean and be safely out of the way. Okay, I zip tied everything underneath. Now we just gotta do it here. I'm gonna remove the air filter box for better access. So here's the original EDC connection cap. We need to remove the cable. So remove this rubber here. This is the connector that's supplied with Bilstein shocks. Plugs into the stock connector here. Then pop in the cap. Connects like that. And all of this can connect here. And then this one connects to here. And I need to tidy up all of this. So the wires are nicely routed, not touching the chassis. Excellent. And that concludes the front strut replacement. While we are here, we can replace the fuel pressure sensor. We have nice and easy access. We had codes for that in the previous episode. Here's the new one. This is updated one, I wanna say. And for this, we need to use an adapter in order to get it to fit. So this is the adapter. Just gonna tighten this real quick. Don't forget an O-ring here. And just snug it up. Okay. Nice and easy. Now we can proceed with the rear shocks. Now you gotta remove all of this trim in the trunk to access the shock top mount. Nice sweater, eh? You gotta remove this plastic fantastic here. Various clips. There we go. Throw this away. Let's unplug the connector. There it is. Now we need to support the suspension here. Okay, and now we can undo the shock bolt. Good. Now we can remove this nut here. Now I can get the shock out. There it is. 100% blown. Kaput! So, no shocks in the back. So there's a rubber cap and like a small bush here, which I want to replace. New shock going in. All right, that's in. Brand new dumper thingy. Then a washer. And then we have two nuts that go here. And the second nut. All right, perfect. And now the wiring. 
sneak the connector through the connector and plug it in. Brand new bolt, finger tight, and the final torque is done with the car down on the ground and suspension fully loaded at right height because this is a bushing. Now I'm going to copy paste on the other side. I wanted to show you something. Here's what driving in German winters for about two weeks does to your car. Remember our freshly refurbished calipers? Yeah, the rust is starting to come through here and here and obviously here where the parts were not painted and here for some reason. But more interestingly, the stainless steel brake line is starting to rust as you can see here and here a lot as you can see. Same thing on the other side as well. So I need to warranty this brake line with Pro brake, this shouldn't have happened. As far as the caliper goes, I talked to Foliatech about this and they told me that I need to add a lot more layers of this paint when painting the calipers with it. I did two to three. They told me you gotta do six to eight and here where the paint was a bit thinner, that's where it's starting to rust. Otherwise here, it's totally fine. The front ones are fine as well. So I gotta keep that in mind next time I'm painting the calipers. The front brake lines, however, are fine. Nothing wrong with them, as well as the calipers. No rust, just brake dust. Now we're gonna move the car to the four post lift and torque the rear shocks. Well, would you look at that? The suspension is leveled front to rear. The front is not higher than the rear, which is fabulous. But keep in mind that these are square winter wheels. Once the summer wheels come, they're gonna fill up that gap a bit more and it's gonna look even better. I'm really happy with this. Just driving here like this, I can already tell you the suspension feels a million times better. It's soft, it's actually comfortable. And it needs fuel, which is good because we're about to replace the fuel pump. What a beautiful day. The torque speculation for the rear shock bolt is 100 Nm. As we learned in the previous episode, the left mirror is drunk. So it folds in perfectly fine. Now when you open it, it should stop right here. But as you can see, it doesn't. There's a pin here in the base of the mirror that's supposed to come out and stop the mirror and that pin is stuck. If you remember, we had to fix this on the right side on Project Rally. So now we're gonna remove the mirror, take this apart, clean that pin and fix this very annoying issue. So if I stop it with my hand, it's gonna stop there. But when you lock the car, it just folds in that way. Pop the tweeter speaker, should just, yeah. Pop out, let it dangle like that, and we can access three screws normally. So there should be a connector here. And this is why I love BMW. This is great engineering. You don't have to remove the door panel. Okay, a quick way to fix this issue is to fold the mirror that way, I believe. Then you can drill a hole in the base and then spread some WD-40 in there to loosen up that pin. And that apparently works, but in my opinion, that's a temporary fix because you're not actually cleaning the dirt that's causing the pin to get stuck. So we're gonna take this apart and attempt to clean that pin properly like we did on Project Rally. Remove the mirror. Three screws. Is there another one? No, but they're plastic tabs which we are probably going to break. So I'm using zip ties to hold the clips in place. I can remove the cover without breaking it. There it is. Looks like I didn't break the clips, which is very good. Aha, uh -huh. two more screws here. A clip here. Oh no, this is not the same setup as with the, as with the E60. We're gonna have to dremel and break this and then replace the sleeve with a threaded one. Okay, I found a threaded sleeve, two of them actually. So let's take this apart completely. Put that on the side as well and let's, oh, that comes off. Okay, I'm gonna use compressed air and blow this out a little bit. What we're gonna do now is destroy the top of this sleeve so we can remove the spring and then separate the wing 
from the mirror base. But before we do that, we need to measure where the spring sits. Um, that's 14 millimeters, 14 to 15 millimeters. So remember that, write it down on your forehead. So break out the Dremel and start chopping this thing here without damaging the cable. Safety Googlers. Okie doke, so I made recesses in the top of the sleeve and now I'm gonna bend them inwards. It's thin metal so it bends easy. Ah. Oh! Ah! Stabbed myself with the screwdriver. Ah, my f***er. Ah, I'm bleeding. Okay, soldier on. There it is. Uh, need to extract the wires somehow. I don't need to cut the wires. Can just unclip the connector here. Right? Yes. And now pull through the wire. Boom! The base is free. So I need to knock this out. So that's the old sleeve. Put this on the side and now we can focus on this part here. And now you can clearly see the pin that's causing the issues. Behind the pin there's a spring and it should pop out so you can stop the mirror. But this one is solidly stuck. Rust loser. Man, that thing is stuck. Let's see, a magnet. It will not come out with the magnet. This is completely stuck. There's no way you will be able to do this without taking it apart. Okay, I need to see if I can remove this plastic. It should be hiding gears there. Okay, that's the guts of it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a hole on this side. Yep, and it still won't come out. There it is. So there's a hole on this side so you can push out the pin and it's still very much stuck. So there's no way you will be able to get this out with just spritzing WD-40 on it. No way. There it is, it is finally out. So this pin was solidly seized in there. Okay, now we need to clean all of this. Brake cleaner. Yeah, there's there's corrosion on this pin. That's why it's stuck. Grab a fine scotch brite and polish the pin. A fine scotch brite is not working out, so I'm stepping up to a bit more aggressive one. Just like that, the pin is now clean. And now we need to clean the hole. Just jab in there with a screwdriver. And now with that clean, pop in the spring and the pin and make sure that it's moving freely, which it is. Brilliant. So pop it out. On Project Rally, I used silicone grease here to make sure it's lubed up, but come to think of it, that probably wasn't the smartest idea because grease will attract dirt. We're gonna use this PTFE spray, a dry lubricant. Spritz a bit of that in the hole and on the pen. And now pop it in. And then a bit of silicone grease for the gears here. They have a cover, so I'm likely to have dirt in here. Now you can reinstall the cover, plug in the connector for the motor, and then reinstall the motor. I cleaned this bit here. Now you can pop it in. Now you're gonna polish the mirror base. That's better. This hollow threaded bolt, it's M12 by 54 millimeters. It's readily available on eBay. So this is gonna replace that sleeve that we destroyed. So it goes in there. Then we're gonna put the wing on and use a nut to secure it. The spring and a wrong nut. It's different thread than the bolt. So we're gonna cross thread this and that way it's never gonna come off. So I'm gonna put this white washer underneath of the spring. Commence the cross threading. Yes. Measure. That's it, perfect. We have 14 to 15 millimeters and the wing is now firmly in place and this is a serviceable item now. Fortunately, the connector is too thick to go through the through the bolt. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have to chop off the connector, get the wire through the bolt, and then resolder it.
And that's the connector resoldered. That had to be done because you can't unpin it. Okay, that's the connector back in place. And it's just a matter of reassembly. Let's quickly test it and see if it works. Boom! The repair is successful. I've done this repair with a hollow bolt with lots of mirrors now and it always works perfectly. Test. Both of them are working. Brilliant. And it only cost me a bit of time and my thumb. The clutch pedal. I complained in the previous video that the clutch pedal on this car sucks. And this is by far the worst clutch pedal I ever felt in a BMW. Let me explain why. First of all, the clutch pedal, it's very light. It takes no effort to press it, which you might think is good, but it's not because this makes the clutch pedal very vague. There is no feedback from the clutch pedal. So when you're trying to shift quickly, you can't really tell what the clutch is doing because also the pedal feel changes when you press it about there, then the spring kicks in, hence that springy feel in the, in the pedal. So when you're trying to shift quickly, it has this pop-up effect, which you probably can't see on camera, but you can feel it when you press the clutch. Like I press it in, let go, there's that feel from the pedal. The second issue is there is a ton of dead travel on the top. Like this is where, when the clutch actually starts to engage. So you can see that the pedal is quite high compared to the brake pedal. And then there's a ton of dead travel on the bottom. So you press it all the way in, then you let go, and this is where the clutch starts to engage. So it's just not good for quick shifting. It makes it really unpleasant to drive. So I did a bit of Googling and it turns out I'm not the only one that thinks that the clutch pedal on this car sucks. And one very popular mod that people do is they remove the stupid spring behind the clutch pedal and this improves the pedal feel by a lot. So here's the clutch and there's the vicious spring. There's one spring on the outside and another one on the inside. So when you press in the clutch, first that outer spring is giving you feedback and then when you press it further, the second one kicks in. So the feedback from the pedal is completely different. It changes as you press the pedal and the second spring is, I believe, what's causing that pop-up feel in the pedal and, well, the entire assembly there is causing this springy feel in the pedal. So I actually removed this spring completely, which is what most people do, and my god, you have to do that if you have an E92 or E90 M3, even the normal E90. Just remove that stupid thing. Without that spring, the clutch pedal is near perfect. The feedback is linear, it's not too light, it's just perfect, it feels great. It's much easier to shift. So that's bye-bye. The second issue that we need to address is obviously the height of the pedal and then the dead travel in the pedal and also the dead travel in the bottom. The bottom one, that's easy. You can just put a clutch stop here. This one, well, let me show you what we have. So I put the spring in just temporarily so I can demonstrate this, but let me, let me remove it real quickly. So remove the devil. So you have two pins, two clips. Just pull that out and remove this garbage. And this is how it looks like. So two springs. I believe pre-LCI only has one spring. They actually made the clutch pedal worse than the LCI. And I checked on Project Rally. It too has this stupid clutch setup, but only one, which I removed. And again, totally improved clutch pedal feel. I love it. So. On Project Rally, I'm also running the clutch without this, with this stupid thing. So just trash it, get rid of it. I bought this from the States, the ultimate clutch pedal. This is an all aluminum short throw clutch pedal for the one series and three series. Does not work on the five series. It's completely different. It comes with brass bushings here and a clutch stop. So now we're gonna pop it in and see how it feels. It also comes with instructions how to install it. To remove the clutch pedal, obviously you gotta remove the spring. There's another one on the top that you need to unclip. Then there's a pin for the master cylinder here that we need to pull out. 
and then a clip uh, right over there and then this entire thing is gonna come out <clears throat> push the pin out come on oh well something popped yes I think I'm gonna get safety googlers now <sighs> Okay, and remove the spring. The spring is out. Success. Well, there you have it, a direct comparison. This is how the stock clutch pedal sits. It's so much higher than the UCP. This thing sucks. This. Boom, done. For the clutch stop, just take out a little plug here and then pop it in there. You can also put it in the carpet here, but the carpet is really thin here, so you're gonna be hitting the firewall over there. So here, I think it's better. So this is gonna take care of the dead travel that we have on the bottom. Okay, let's see how it feels. Oh man, that's the stuff. The pedal travel is so much shorter. It feels like my E39 M5 now. Look at that. That is a perfect amount of travel. Beautiful, very happy with that. I'm gonna give you more feedback once I actually drive the car. Now I'm gonna replace the fuel pump and the fuel filter. Ooh, a Euro. Nice. Can buy one rod bearing. A repair manual calls this a filler element. Lift the bottom piece out. Oh, wasn't so bad. Now this one here. Oh. Let's connect the connectors. All right, now I'm gonna break out the vacuum cleaner so we don't get crap in the fuel tank. Now you're gonna disconnect the lines. Does the press in, apparently. So I'm gonna mark the position of this ring here. There we go. I have clean gloves. I'm gonna have to reach in the fuel tank and disconnect a line over there. And there's one here, right on the top. And it seems it won't come out without disconnecting that first. Popped, finally. Now I need to disconnect these connectors here. Now I can pull out this section. This is like the worst pump to replace ever. So now another clip. This goes across the fuel tank to the fuel filter. Okay, that's one part of it out. And now the fuel pump is finally out. What a mess, man. This clip here, you need to press inwards, and yep, the hose will pop off, pop out. Remove this locking ring as well. So this fuel pressure with the fuel regulator, a line goes across the hump of the tank and then it plugs into the fuel pump over there. So you gotta pull all of that out. I've done this in Project Rally and it's a bit of a fuff. And on that car it was much easier because it's a four door. And here I have not a lot of space to work with. Just pull it out. Yeah. There we go. All right. Fuel tank is really clean. So this is the fuel pump. The strainer is here in this bowl and it looks a bit worn out. And this is the fuel filter with the fuel pressure regulator. And you have to sneak this over the hump in the fuel tank and then this connects to this here to the fuel pump so here's a brand new original fuel pump and a brand new original fuel filter this is only available from the dealer and it's expensive and of course new gaskets which they kindly supply with this stuff so first remove the old gasket so brand new gringo first feed the line Maybe, 
maybe, just maybe it's a cross. This is a shorter fuel tank than on the M5. Yes, it's a cross, like lacrosse. That really wasn't that bad at all. This needs to go in. So there's a specific slot for the, like that. Okay, that's good. I had to hit the pause on the fuel pump because I ordered the wrong one. Turns out there are two versions, the US spec and the Euro spec one. The US spec has two connections here, which is what we have on the car. This car is US spec. I ordered the Euro spec, which only has one. So I simply replaced the cap. The rest of the pump is exactly the same. I also got new locking rings and finally a proper tool to do this stuff. And not hammer on this like an ape. A new one. That clipped in. Now the line from the fuel filter. Gotta hear that click. Pop in the fuel cap. So there's actually a notch in the in the lock screw cap that we need to line up with the notch on the fuel tank. Nice. So that's the notch lined up. It's here. Connect the connectors and that's it. Now we're going to refurbish the headlights. The covers are very pitted, so I want to replace them and refresh them. And the light output, it's not that great. And I love driving at night. And for driving at night, I need a good set of headlights. So we are going to upgrade the projectors at the same time. To remove the headlights, we need to remove the bumper. Man, the way the salt is attacking these screws here is insane. These are all brand new. Two eight mil screws holding the bumper in. Clip the line for the washers. Is that it? Are you free? There it is. And the headlight is out. There's one more screw here and then we can get rid of this plastic shroud. That's the headlight finally free. These are the new projectors, LZ7 that I got from Sweetlip. Actually the same projectors I used on Project X5, if you remember. And these are about the best projectors I ever put in headlights. And I've done many sets of headlights. They are just fantastic. The light output is phenomenal. So I'm really excited to put these in the M3 headlights. Same as with the X5, these are adaptive headlights, which means they swivel as you turn the steering wheel. So here are the supply brackets and a lot of trimming is going to be needed to get them to fit. Just finished messing with the left one and the procedure is pretty much identical to the X5 as far as the projector installation goes. But these headlights are sealed with butyl, which means they're much easier to open unlike the Permaseal headlights. So first we're gonna clean the headlight. All-purpose cleaner from Gion. Okay, that's nice and clean. Now we need to remove the cover. There's one screw here that we need to remove first. So lift this up. Remove the turn signal bulb. To remove the cover, you can either pop this in the oven for about 10 minutes, that'll soften up the butyl, and then you can start prying off the cover. I'm gonna use a heat gun, that's my preferred method. Go all around, make the butyl nice and soft, tacky, and then start prying this thing open. You gotta be careful here, because everything is plastic and it breaks easily, so don't pry too hard, just lots of heat. Good old butyl. All right, put this on the side for now. Remove this cover here. The previous owner installed quality angel eye bulbs and I'm gonna leave that. Remove this cover here. Remove the bulb. Unplug some wires here. 
This is for the Bisonon function. This one here is for the adaptive function. Let's connect this wire here. Unscrew the screw and remove the ground. Now we need to remove the shroud here. Got a few screws around. Carefully pull that out. Put this on the side. Now this shroud here and careful, don't touch this with your greasy fingers. It's very easy to damage and remove the chrome coating. So unclip the line here. Remove it. Two screws here. A wire for the adaptive function here. Press in the tabs on this white plastic. Start pulling out the entire thing like that. Then unclip it here. And the whole thing is gonna come out. So this is the thingamajigger. First we need to remove the motor for the adaptive function. Two screws. Now we need to pry up this plastic. Nice. And now you can see how the adaptive function works. This is how the projector moves when you drive and turn the steering wheel. Driven by that little motor here. Now we need to loosen these eight mil nuts for them and remove the projector. So this one you can just pull up. And that's the crappy old projector. Actually the surface inside, it's totally fine. It's not burned. But this is a very, very old projector developed in the 90s by Bosch. Remove this bottom bracket and be careful with this clip here. It'll actually shoot out and earlier I spent 13 days looking for it. So lift that up. Also remove this bracket here on the side. This is the supply bracket and first we can mount it to the brackets of the adaptive housing. And now we can pop this in and we can see where we need to do the first round of grinding because remember this needs to move freely in there and right now it doesn't. So I'm going to take a marker, just mark wherever I need to trim the bracket and once I'm done trimming we can test fit it again. So I'm going to fire up the Dremel and start trimming. You get the idea, I'm going to do it over there in the corner so I don't make a lot of mess on the table. The first round of trimming is done. This can now move freely in the bracket. Now I'm going to shorten the screws, then mount the projector, and then more trimming is needed so that the projector can move freely inside of this assembly. So mount the bracket to the projector with supplied screws. So first we need to trim down this bracket here, just the edges here. Here's how that looks, and now it clears the projector. Put it in. And now I can start trimming the bracket further. Okay, I'm gonna continue trimming and then I'll update you once it's done, because this is rather boring. The trimming has been completed, so I trimmed all around to make sure that the projector can move freely inside of this bracket. Had to trim this here as well. It's pretty much identical to what I did on the X5. So now I need to remove this bracket and then expand the holes so we can rotate the projector. Very important. That way we can align the cutoff of the projectors and make sure that they are parallel with each other. So five and a half mil drill and we are going to slowly expand the holes. Beautiful. Now, lots of compressed air to blow out all of the metal shavings and then we can assemble it. With the holes expanded, now we can rotate the projector and thus adjust the cutoff line. It has to be perfectly horizontal and aligned with the other projector. Don't forget the clip on the bottom. Then the projector goes in. All right, and there you have it. The new projector moves freely in the adaptive function thingy bracket. So now we need to put it back in the headlight and test it. First, we need to solder in the connector for the bi-xenon function. So this is the stock one. Just need to chop it off. 
and then solder in this one. The motor. The bulb. And now we can put it back in. So connect all of the connectors. That's the projector in. And now off to the car to test it. Do we have a working projector? We do, two of them. And the bi -Xenon is fully functional as well. Right, now I'm gonna put back the shroud, bolt in the headlight, and then we're gonna go outside and check if the projectors are aligned and if we need to further tweak them. Okay, I don't know how much you can see here, but they do need tweaking. They are not aligned. The left one needs to go a bit that way and the right one a bit that way, and then they're gonna be perfectly aligned and parallel. And here we are, the projectors are now perfectly aligned. As you can see, the cutoff line, it looks beautiful. This is the trickiest bit because if you get this wrong and you assemble the headlights, you have to take them apart again to, you know, make sure they're aligned because if they're not aligned, it's just gonna look ugly and it's not gonna perform as good. And now we can reassemble the headlights. First, I'm going to remove old butyl. So I'm gonna use a heat gun, heat it up and remove as much as I can. It doesn't have to be perfectly clean, but just majority off needs to be removed so we can use fresh stuff. That's the old stuff removed. Blow out the housing with compressed air. Clean the lens. Now I need to remove this trim and transfer it over on the new cover. Here's a brand new one. Unfortunately, original or OEM headlight covers are not available for these headlights. So I went with aftermarket eBay ones. I don't like polishing old covers as they will never look like brand new ones. And I've used aftermarket covers in the past with good results, like on the X5. But here I ran into problems that cost me time and nerves. As I later discovered that these crappy covers are defective and not made properly. You can see that once I put the cover over the projector, the cutoff line gets distorted this yellow spot appears and the light output becomes duller. I had to trash these covers and thankfully David from Sweetlip had a pair of new original AL headlights lying around. So he removed the covers and sent them to me so I could finish this project. Big props to him and if you end up using aftermarket covers as sometimes there is no other option, be sure to test them before closing the headlights. I know I will. Time to start laying down fresh butyl. I have a bit of water here so it doesn't stick to my gloves. So. Okay, now I'm gonna heat up the butyl really, really good and then push the new cover on. Okay, that'll do it. Yes, gooey man, gooey. The clips need to clip in. There's one. Now we can start the screw here. And boom, the cover is on. Look at that! Brand spanking new. Better than brand new actually, because the projectors are far superior. New bulbs all around. So we have chrome or silver turn signal bulbs. This is very expensive by the way. Awesome Nightbreaker bulbs. Then brand new H3 bulb. Good. Then have a brand new cover here. Comes with a brand new gasket. Just need to transfer over this trim here. And lastly, the sweater stripping piece that goes on top here. Done.
time to test everything. High beams. Yes. The other one. Success. These are the chrome kidney grills that I put in the previous episode. And this is incorrect for this car. The pre-LCI models had complete kidney grills. The LCI models, which is this car, had chrome surroundings and black inserts. So we're gonna change them for the right ones. There we go. Don't scratch the headlight. I just spent an hour and a half lining up all of the gaps between the bumper and the hood around the headlights. And I got this gap pretty good here. It was pretty massive before, and that's because this bumper is sagging. So when I push it up, it takes up the gap almost all the way. Uh, that being said, this bumper needs to be replaced. It's US spec, it's been replaced, it's been repaired before. So that needs to be done. But around the headlights, everything looks good. Like the line here, and the bottom, and then this one as well. And then this here is nice and flush with the fender as well, so I'm quite happy with this. Here we go, correct kidney grills. The difference in light output is frankly astonishing. I'm using exactly the same settings on the camera so I can show you a true before and after. You can clearly see how much more light the new projectors are emitting and how brighter the hotspot is. You also get a beautiful sharp cutoff line. If you love driving at night, I can't recommend this upgrade enough. It's one of my favorite mods on any car. This window rubber seal is perished, so we're going to replace it. Here's the new one. So start it in the corner first and then start feeding it into the channel. Nicely done. And now brand new original taillights. We are going to protect them with ceramic coating from Gion. Nice. One connector. So the reason I'm replacing these is they're US spec and they are very pitted and scratched all over the place, especially the inner ones. And this left one has a massive scratch. And I love, love these taillights and I want to have them brand new. You know the drill. New one going in. Then the inner ones. While we are here, we can do the trunk shocks. These are rusty and weak. OE Stabilus. Right, you gotta do the same on the front. Look at these gorgeous daylights. One of the main reasons why I love the shape of this car and the design. Beautiful. Fog lights. Yep, brakes. Yeah, I can see that we have that as well. And reverse lights. The M3 badge is a bit weathered, so a new one is in order. Mark its position. Dental floss. Plastic blade. A bit of spit. Here's the new badge. Ah. 
Ah, beautiful. That looks great. Next, the emblem. It too is pretty weathered. Oh man, what the, come on, let go. Ow, hit me, <laughs> hit myself in the face. Jesus. Brand new grommets. Brand new emblem. This unsightly dent here is the biggest imperfection on the outside of the car. And I have my PDR guy here. Just removed the fender liner and he's gonna try and straighten it out as much as possible. It's not gonna be possible to do it like 100% because this is a very sharp dent and also it removed paint. So if he can get it as flat as possible, then I can touch it up and it's gonna be about, well, 90% better hopefully. Right now it's, it's pretty ugly as you can see. So he's pushing the dent out from the inside. When the dent is this sharp, you can't do it with just glue and pulling. You have to press the metal from the back. And just like that, the dent is gone. What you see now, that is just a scratched surface where the paint is missing. But as far as the dent goes, it is completely gone. This can be further improved with wet sanding and polishing, but this car is gonna go to Gion for a complete detail eventually. So I'm gonna let Eve do that. I think he can make this scratch almost completely disappear, but I think at least 80% better than what it is right now. Thankfully it didn't go down to the bare metal, hence why it didn't start rusting. The car was sitting outside for like two years. So I'm not gonna touch it up right now because that's just gonna make it more pronounced. But as far as the dent goes, this looks a lot better. And now the blueberry muffin on the top of the cake. After much heated debate between myself and the board members, I decided to go with brand spanking new original competition wheels, style M359, if I'm not mistaken. Here they are. I bought them from Daniel from Auto House Melkus from Dresden. The old ones, I dropped them off to be refinished to Hyper Silver, and they are going to be done in a few weeks, and then I'm going to be selling them. But for Project Frankfurt, I decided to go with brand new wheels. Don't cut too deep. Yes! Hyper silver, baby. Look at that. Brand new without a scratch. Okay, so I have tires inside and I'm gonna take this to the tire shop so they can scratch them and uh, install the tires in the process. So I'll catch you in a bit, but man, do they look beautiful. The wheels are back and they survived. They didn't play scratch lottery with them, which is fantastico. The tires, we have Continental Sport 59. Nope, it's seven. Now we need to protect the wheels. For that, we have Gion rim ceramic coating and also brand new wheel caps. Line it up with the M emblem. Beautiful. <whistles> yeah. Lastly, the tire dressing from Gion. And that's one done, three to go. Say adios to the winter wheels. And say bonjour to the summer wheels. Hey, that car looks familiar. 
Nico is behind the wheel. We are at Infinitas in Gachenbach and Project Frankfurt is about to go on the lie detector. Time to see how much power this newly built engine makes. Mm, look at them projectors. This is a very, very good lie detector. And I'm also happy to announce that I connected two great companies, Liquid Moly and Infinitas. They just made a really nice partnership, so they're gonna be working together. So what horsepower numbers do you normally see on this dyno with the stock E90 oh, M3? Normally around about 390, 380. So E92 M3 on a dyno. These cars from the factory, they're supposed to have 420 PS, but they're famous for delivering less than what the factory said. It typically almost always starts with three, and that number is usually around 390 horsepower. I just asked Nico and he told me that he only had one car out of like 100 that made more than 400 horsepower. So with this particular build, we have OEM plus engine, let's call it that. We have high compression forged Mali Motorsport pistons. Uh, the compression is 12.2 to one. The stock is 12.0 to one. So in reality, it won't make that much of a difference when it comes to performance. We do have Shriek cams. We also have cylinder heads from Topmar Motorworks. They ported the exhaust side, which wasn't ported from the factory, and they also did a multi-angle valve job. On top of that, we have one more mod. So I'm expecting definitely more power than stock, but the factory said more than 420. How much? I'm not sure. There's a base tune on the car right now, so we're gonna do the first run with that, and then go from there, see if it needs further fine tuning and whatnot. The car does run really healthy. We have about 2,300, 400 kilometers since the engine rebuild. Yeah. On the first run with the base tune, we got 415 PS and 389 Nm meters of torque, which is already better than stock. And then Max from Infinitas started tuning the car. This dyno calculates and shows crank horsepower. They noted that the engine was breathing in the air extremely well and they could easily add more fuel to the mixture. This is due to Shriek cams and the phenomenal work the Topmar did with the heads. They are indeed working like crazy, just like Lukas said. I think he also raised the RPM line to 8,800 now. And uh, he says it's safe to do that even on a stock engine stock heads that is drivetrain but this engine remember has Shrik cams plus Shrik valve springs and titanium retainers so we are definitely safe to go higher than stock stock is 8400 i believe Woo! 438 nice and 405 newton meters of torque that's that's more like it better huh much better much better <laughs> Here we go, 14th dyno run and we have 442 horsepower, 417 newton meters of torque. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. This dip here that you see here between 4 and 5, that's Shrik cams. They deliver more high-end, top-end power. As you can see from around 5, 5.5, five it starts picking up. But this power delivery here, this is 8,800 RPM and it's pulling all the way to the top. So here's a direct comparison to a completely stock E92 M3 that was on this dyno and that one made around 390 horsepower and less than 400 newton meters of torque. So the black line is the stock car, the red line is Project Frankfurt. Quite a big difference. Wouldn't you agree? And you can see that even the stock one has this slight dip here. It's just not as pronounced because of the uh, Shrek cams that we have here. The top end power is just beautiful. 
absolutely beautiful here. Keep in mind that you can go to 10 different dinos and you will get 10 different results. The results can vary depending on the dino brand, dino operator, etc. This is a very accurate dino that Infinitas uses for testing for OE brands and corrections are done according to EEC. So the fact that Project Frankfurt put down 50 to 60 ponies more than what S65s typically put down is an amazing result and achievement. Quite happy with everything. Yeah. <laughs> Quite happy with everything. The car is very, very healthy. The engine is making a lot more power than stock. And huge, huge thank you to Nico and Infinitas. As you can see, they don't just sell superchargers here. You can come here for tuning as well. And we did 14 dyno runs, I think. Yeah. 14, that's what it says, 14. 14, we spent, what time is it? I came here at 12, it's 5.40 now. So proper tuning takes time. <laughs> Needs a little bit of time. Small this is the most power that any NAM3 made on this dyno, right? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Really, really nice. Thank you so much again. You're welcome. machine what an engine in the previous episode we couldn't go wide open throttle because the engine was still in the braking phase but in this one we can we've done nearly 3,000 kilometers since the engine rebuild and as you saw on the dyno the engine is performing beautifully and now we're gonna go and stretch its legs on the autobahn so the hard cut rev limiter is at 8,800 rpm but right after 8,500 rpm the throttle bodies are closing and it's not making more power than that so 8,500 is the rpm line on this engine stock it's 8,400 there's the sign, punch it. engine feels it's, it's it's a race engine the way it revs the way it goes it's spectacular <laughs> heel and toe now super easy in a curve feels fantastic it feels faster than E39 M5 for sure E16 is faster has more power but man what a sensational car Rev 
matching in this car. It's absolutely beautiful. It's glorious. It is glorious. Healing to as well. Let's talk about the mods and upgrades that I've done to this car. Bilstein B6 Demtronic shocks by Volvo Automotive. The ride is sublime because in comfort it's actually comfortable. It's more comfortable than B6 shocks on the E60 M5. And I love that because on the E60 I always thought it could be a tiny bit more comfortable in the comfort mode. Here it's just perfect and right now I have it in the sport setting which is the middle one. And it is fantastic on the Autobahn and attacking the back roads. And then you have the Sport Plus setting, which is going to be great for the Nürburgring. So I talked to Imran about this and I gave him my feedback and I told him that the suspension is phenomenal. Because besides the fantastic ride, it also looks good. There's no that stupid rake. So Imran is going to work now to develop the same set of shocks for the E60 M5 platform. And I'm really, really excited about that. The shifter, Rogue Engineering shifter, it's the same feel as on the E46. It is the best feeling shifter I ever tried in any BMW. It is so satisfying to change gears because it's short, it's precise, there's no slop whatsoever. It's just beautiful click click action so I highly recommend it. The ultimate clutch pedal, probably the best clutch pedal I ever felt in a BMW so a must mod on any E90 and 1 Series as well. My E39 M5 has a perfect clutch pedal as well because I have a different clutch stop on the back but this is just beautifully linear. It just feels really good when you press it because it's short so you can really quickly change gears and rev matching, heel and toe, super easy which wasn't the case before. The suspension as well, it is sharper than my toenail. It feels really good. I still need to do the wheel alignment. I have an issue with that. I can't find a good wheel alignment shop in the Frankfurt area. It just doesn't exist. So right now, even with the not properly aligned car, the suspension feels great. And once it's aligned, it's gonna be even better. Damn, it feels good. We mustn't forget about the brakes. I had several hard stops on the Autobahn at high speed and the brakes are really, they really inspire confidence. They bite really, really well. The brake pedal feels nice and linear. You can really get into it. It's not like that it bites really hard all of a sudden and then it changes. It's just really nice linear feeling. And the driver discs, they're not shaking, they're not vibrating, anything. I mean, you can really punish the brakes and they're going to hold up. So I'm really looking forward to trying this car on the Nürburgring once they reopen again. It's gonna be really, really fun. Listen, I know that the DCT is much quicker and it's well suited to this car, but you can't heal and toe and rev match with your feet and your hands in automatic but you can with a manual and, and that's why I will always pick a manual car. There you go. The brakes feel splendid. everyone to the race car for the road so as far as the multimedia goes in this car this has the later c 
CIC, CCC, something, I, I don't know. I don't care. Uh, it has the newer stuff than the E60 M5, and I'm probably the only person in the world that actually prefers the older system. This one has a far better display, but everything else I prefer on the E60 because it has less buttons here, it's cleaner, the knob it's nicer, it's aluminium in the E60, and just, you know, commanding the radio, it's much nicer than here. Here I have to turn, then press, and it doesn't work that well. The Bluetooth, it's garbage. I can't use it in this car for some reason. It works for about five minutes, and then it completely cuts off, and it gives me a very annoying high-pitched noise while doing that, and then it disconnects. And then I can connect again for another five to 10 minutes, then it plays music for another 10 minutes, and then it disconnects again. So I need to look, look into the Bluetooth module and see what's going on there. But, you know, all these sub-menus and stuff, don't need any of that. I just need to play the radio, stream Bluetooth, that's it. Nothing else. Not interested in tech. Right? It's so damn pretty. I can't stop staring at it. E92 M3, my dream car and it didn't disappoint. It's actually better than what I thought it would be. This pretty much concludes Project Frankfurt. It's back on the road. The engine, it's a masterpiece and we get to use all of its screaming 8,500 roars and it's making more power than it did from the factory. It looks, well, if this car was a lady, this video would have been uploaded to a different platform. Anyway, as you all know, project cars, they're never done. There's always something to be done. But for me, once it's registered, it's back on the road and I get to use the car, I call it done. Anything I do beyond that point, it's improving the car. So there will be a few more episodes here and there. We need to repaint the front bumper, the side skirts, the rear bumper. They're slightly different color and then the exterior needs to be detailed. Besides that, we're going to overhaul the rear end at some point. But as it sits right now, I just want to enjoy the car as much as I can. I love driving it and, you know, I can focus on other projects that are not on the road. A huge thank you is in order for following the channel, for watching the videos and leaving beautiful comments on every single one of them and helping me obtain my dream car. And not only that, but to fix it to the point where it's better than what it was when it was brand new. It rides better and it's faster. I mean, what more can one want? And we kept it stock on the outside because you, you shouldn't mess with this design. You don't, you don't touch it. It's far too beautiful. So thank you to all of you and to my Patreons as well. The next episode is going to be on the E31 or Project Nut, a BMW. It needs an engine, so it should be a fun one. Thank you so much for watching. I really do hope that you enjoyed this project series and I'll see you in the next one. I'm gonna sit on my stallion here and just, you know, stare at it for a bit.